So anyway, thank you. Thank you, uh, Joyce, for, uh, for joining us today. I have so many yeah. questions. I have my phone here full of questions. Great. That I'll be, I hope, uh, you know, I usually try to keep these to about a half hour, and I'm not sure we'll be able to do that uh, this time. But, um, but let's start. I mean, again, you know, you're, you're a professional. You're a consultant who has covered so much ground in adaptation and resilience. And we can talk about, you know, really anything. Um, and we will over many conversations. This is not the, the only one. But in this case, you know, I want to cover a couple of things. And, 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 and one is um, companies and, and, and signals to companies. Um, uh, what is your take on, you know, when you sit with uh, corporate leaders in boardrooms and, and they bring you in to do some consulting work, um, what's on their minds? What is it when you walk away from those meetings that you keep thinking? What needs to change? What signals need to, to change for these companies to, to, get, uh, to get with it, to get with the program? That's a great question. Well, I would say there's three things. Um, the first is that, you know, when we think about the resilience gap, that is the gap between what we need to do to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions and the gap between what we need to do to adapt. I think many corporations feel as though still that the adaptation arrow working towards reducing this gap is no man's land. It's not what you should be doing. You should be trumpeting mitigation. When you begin to adapt, you begin to give in. You're saying, oh, climate change has arrived and we now are going to have to deal with it in a more you know, direct way. So we need the first thing I try to do with any corporate um, collaborator is to help them see that adaptation has collateral benefits for them right now. So it's not that they're giving in that, oh, you know, we failed at mitigation, so now we have to adapt, but rather that mitigation needs to go harder, faster, and towards those incredible targets of greenhouse gas reductions that most leading corporations have. And at the same time, corporate leaders need to work on any sort of resilience or adaptation that will increase their market share, help improve the uh, livelihoods and lives of their employees, and really bring um, the, uh, the, the set of actors that deal in the resilience space to their doorstep. So it should be seen as an opportunity. So that's number one. Number two is that for many corporations, they actually are already seeing risk from climate change. But when we think about adaptation, often in the corporate sphere, it's handled by the chief sustainability officer in a corporation. And that person doesn't necessarily deal with risk. They started their lives dealing with like paper and double-siding paper and reducing you know, paper waste in the bathrooms. That's where they began. And then they got into greenhouse gas reduction, scope one and scope two and reporting through the carbon disclosure project. That was two. And then they got into dealing with things like how to engage their employees and volunteering efforts efforts for tree planting and, and cleaning up neighborhoods to make them more sustainable. That was the third thing. But the dealing with adaptation, that doesn't fit necessarily into the realm of the chief sustainability officer because it has a lot to do with how to accommodate these physical risks from climate change. So it might better be suited to the chief risk officer, whoever deals with enterprise risk management in a corporation, or even whoever deals with liability. So that's the second thing when I sit down with a, a, a leader in a corporation is to sort of help them think about what leadership matters to adaptation. Yes, sustainability leaders, for sure and risk officers and legal officers. All of them are part of the adaptation or risk mitigation uh, resilience piece. So I think that's the second thing around corporations. And then the third is to really ask, you know, in your supply chain, do you have assets that right now require you to take a bridge to get to them, like maybe offshore for cloud computing, or that require your colleagues to be in places that tend to have vector-borne disease, like maybe you're working in uh, arena where there already is, you know, tick and mosquito um, issues, or that require you to have adequate sources of water. Just those three examples alone, typically every corporation, if they're a global fortune, you know, a thousand, is going to have one or another of those, maybe all three of them, somewhere within their value chain of supply. And every one of those is a really strong indicator for a risk coming from climate change. And generally, if, if they think long enough, some of them can imagine it instantaneously, but some of them need a little more time to realize, you know what, there was a dengue 
outbreak that affected my employees in that part of our supply chain. Or we did have the bridge go down in extreme storm getting to our offshore cloud computing um, or, you know, any of the other, you know, evident risks. There are really fascinating data around corporate um, impact from climate risks. Pointing to those data can also be helpful. But I would say those are the three things um, that I think about when I talk to, to you know, to, to executives. Okay, that's, that's, uh, that's a great um, approach uh, to these companies. And so what's the response? I mean, when, I mean, when, 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 you, when you deliver that message, what do you usually get back from them in terms of, I mean, do they just nod their heads and say, okay, it'll, it's a to-do for 10 years from now or five years from now when, uh-huh. when we start feeling more of those uh, pains and, or when we start um, uh, seeing more of those opportunities and, and, and choose to capitalize them? Or um, what's, the, what's the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the feedback from Well, that? I mean, I can give you a few specific examples. Um, I won't name names of corporations, sure. but um, one major um, fast food purveyor, you know, when we spoke with him about the fact that he was going to need to be thinking about canola oil and his production of canola um, in order to continue to be a robust provider of French fries, um, he was like, look, to me, what will happen is as I see that the canola production is going down, maybe due to drought in the northern parts of the United States, I'm going to go to Canada, literally the government of Canada, because I'm a huge purchaser of canola. And I'm going to say, you need to translate some of your fields to canola because I'm going to start buying it from you now. So they, that particular company's response to my points about, you know, the fact that this risk is here and something that they should be handling, um, their response was, we are going to outrun climate change. You know, this is within the next 10 years, it's not hard for us to imagine going to the most, a more northerly place for that particular piece of supply. So that's one example. Um, another example, though, would be a company like, uh, let's say, I can actually name a name here, BlackRock. Um, they're a large financial um, house. They manage um, many billions of dollars in assets. And um, they had a chief sustainability officer who, for a long time, was, although he reported into the chief executive officer, which is not necessarily typical, right? Often chief sustainability officers or anybody who deals in sustainability may be more to a lieutenant or a managerial level. In this case, BlackRock had already been proactive, and they put the sustainability person in the, in the C-suite. And um, his job initially was to do social impact investing, right? Find specific investments for, his, uh, for, for these assets that they could claim to be green or about social equity or not tainted with tobacco or weapons, right? So his social impact investing um, was a great part of, but a very small wedge within the vertical of BlackRock's investment portfolio. He though saw that across the board, every asset that BlackRock was managing had the imp- potential to be impacted by climate change. So because he had access to the C-suite, he was able to go and say, look, we should really be talking about how to adapt our portfolio in an era of climate change, and we should be free to talk about it. So I don't know exactly when it happened, but um, I mean, how many then, you know, quarters it took, but the president of BlackRock, Fink, his quarterly letters now are unabashed saying, you may not believe in climate change, but climate change is affecting your portfolio. It is a fact of of, um, impact. And therefore, we as purveyors of the best possible stewardship of your money are thinking about it carefully. And we are making adaptation a part of our portfolio management for you. So that's another example of uh, of, uh, a reaction. I I would say, by the way, that, you know, both of those examples suggest that it's incredibly context specific. And so my third um, isn't a specific example, but it's just a reminder that companies do think beyond the quarter, but generally their time frame is my next board meeting is two and a half months counting down, right? They're just constantly having to gun for their next quarterly release of their numbers and their next board call where sustainability issues may have, you know, less than five minutes Um, on the call, but risk management has a lot longer. And so one of the things that I think is really important um, to help corporations think about um, when we ask this question of how they handle risk is to make sure that they're asking about that 1% potential event, because that 1% potential event, we might call it the one in 100 year uh, issue, is in fact typically incorporating 
what scenarios suggest climate change will bring. So that 1% event could be extreme drought, it could be fire, it could be, um, of course, coastal flooding or inland flooding. And especially because many corporate leaders, at least in the United States, are still wary of saying that they've embraced climate data or that they're in other ways being proactive around climate action. Um, this one in 100 year stress test of their assets can be an excellent way to ensure that they are being, you know, stewards of whatever resources they have, be they capital or human resources moving um, or anywhere in their value chain. So that's, yeah, so a, I think, essential tool for any of us who deal with corporations is to ask for that stress test for that one in 100 year event. Yeah, so it's, it's about aligning the time scales. So what is short term, what is long term? And since they do deal, as you say all the time, with long term, uh, both risk management and opportunity uh, uh, management, then how do we align uh, the timescales to fit their language and their th thinking so they can focus and, and make some decisions uh, that are favorable? Um, I mean, still, I mean, it's, I mean if, if you can clone uh, Joyce Coffee and, and, and have you do that with a thousand companies at the same time, then we could have a, uh, an even bigger impact than you are having, right? So uh so absent that i guess you know we got to deal with market signals and so uh let me ask about market signals that companies uh do listen to like regulation and commodity prices and insurance uh coverage and and bank uh, uh approvals or turn downs and you mentioned blackrock uh shareholder pressure and um you know different sort of uh, market signals those are only some of them Obviously, the supply chain um, uh, interruptions from extreme weather events around the world, but that's a market signal right there telling them that, you know, that they have to take some action. Uh, so how do you see those market signals um, right now and kind of evolve in the next, I don't know, five, mm -hmm. seven years, just to pick a number? I mean, what's, yep. what's your take on that? Your point is extremely important, that there are both peer pressure and policy changes that are happening that I think are quite profound for the market. The first is that back in June of last year, the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosure, TCFD, which is an initiative out of the Financial Stability Board um, in the EU, which is the EU's version of our SEC in the United States, uh, essentially they released this um, set of guidelines for the private sector around how they should be managing climate risks. And by the way, this task force was led by Michael Bloomberg, uh, former mayor of New York and big time financial um, leader, and uh, Mark Carney, who is the head of the Bank of England. So what this task force essentially came out with, I mean, it's complicated, so I don't want to reduce it to too much simplicity, but essentially they said, corporations, you have three areas of risk related to climate change. One is the political risk that comes with, for instance, um, climate, uh, carbon taxing or uh, ca cap and trade. Two is the transition risk that comes with the changes in the market that move away from really heavy greenhouse gas producing industry like coal um, to lower carbon footprint things. So that's a transition in the market. And three is the physical risk from climate change, which is essentially what we're talking about today. So the fact that the physical risk from climate change received equal weight in that triad of three risks from this task force is really profound. The task force was led by financiers. So that's a big, big change. It also set out guidelines for how public companies should report on these three areas of um, their risk. So those are just guidelines. Um, eventually, they may be in promulgated as regulations in certain places. And in fact, uh, in California, the state government has thought about doing some of that. And in Paris, in France, uh, the, the federal government in France has, in fact, created a law called Article 175, which was um, in, its, in its infancy at the same time frame that the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosure was um, starting up and was passed into law just after the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, so that was in 2015 December, and the law was passed in early 2016 and has now become law. And that Article 175 says any public company in France 
that is a, a company listed on the stock exchange is required to report to its issuers what its physical risk from climate change is. So that's like, wow, we've never seen that before. Um, really important. Now, the UK has an adaptation reporting power that even preceded the French Article 175, <coughs> excuse me, and um, we've also seen the EU with a water directive that has a lot of resilience and adaptation elements to it too, which perceived that as well. So there is in Europe examples where regulation has made, um, I think, important strides in being the market signal um, that corporations need to think about their risk. Um, so that's number one. And then I think the number two is that BlackRock and others show a, a lot of hope for peer pressure um, to take leadership on these issues. You know, we think about Unilever as being this extraordinary star um, when it comes to sustainability. Well, who's going to be the star of resilience in the corporate realm? That is an open seat for someone to claim and be crowned. Um, I think BlackRock, you know, in spite of or perhaps because of the activity that um, they were part of that created some of the financial crisis of 2008-2009, it's a little hard to imagine them being crowned as this resilience star. But we also have to look for for even those actors that I think, I mean, this is Joyce's personal view, even those actors that are perhaps in um, difficult to swallow industry, like for instance, agriculture, where there's genetically modified organisms that are also dealing, you know, potentially helping to mitigate uh, drought or um, flooding during certain germination cycles of seed, or the financial services industry, which is really in the business of gleaning more money out of disaster in some cases, where can we actually affect change even in the most um, difficult circumstances, um, as well as in the Unilevers of the world, to create a more resilient place? And I think some of those um, riskier actors are some of our earlier um, adopters because they see the risks so abruptly in their, in their supply yeah. chains. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, um, I mentioned also commodity prices uh, uh, as, as we see uh, extreme weather impacting uh, mining or agriculture or some of these other uh, commodities. Um, how do you see that market, market signal uh, evolving uh, right now and in the near future? One thing I think is really profound about you calling out the extractives as an example is that they generally don't have any way to do what that French fry manufacturer I talked about a moment ago does. They cannot escape climate change. You, there's only one place that you can mine a rare earth, or you know, maybe there are four places in the world you can mine your rare earth mineral. So you have to be there, and you have to therefore create resilience in order for your um, product to be able to thrive. Um, okay, so let's switch from cities to... I mean, from companies to cities, and you've done a lot of work with cities, uh, uh, still do, uh, uh, of course, and I read on your um, uh, website your five-step city action uh, tool that uh, they designed uh, specifically for cities, and, and you've done some work with the um, uh, 100 Resilient Cities Initiative, and um, uh, et cetera. So um, now in terms of, of, of cities, uh, so much is written about cities. I mean, actually, the, the focus of attention and resilience uh, is cities and what cities are doing and what uh, what they need to do more um, uh, and there's a lot going on uh, so what would you say are the key uh, advances right now the key innovations right now the key triggers that that have the promise to accelerate um, uh, resilience adoption by cities uh, and I'm thinking, obviously, you know, again, the 100 resilient cities, um, uh, those 100 cities are doing what they have to do, very well guided, very well thought out. But you have thousands of others that are not in that program and that are in various stages of awareness, action, uh, adoption, and whatnot. Um, so, so when you think of, of you know, if, if we can only, like, trigger or, 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 or kickstart a specific... Um, uh, levers or, or push some particular buttons uh, that will just take this to another level in cities of, around the world. Um, uh, what would you point to, if, if you can? Well, um, I think three things, and one of them you've, you've alluded to, um, mentioning 100 resilient cities. So the networks that currently exist for cities really of almost any size to help move resilience forward are profound, and they are generally quite new. 
Um, you know, I'm certain that any listener working um, in the United States has been in some way touched by the Urban Sustainability Directors Network, even if they've never heard of it, which is a network of hundreds of cities in North America that are working towards sustainability and have made a very strong commitment to adaptation. And they're learning from one another, tripping over each other, and really creating a ton of vibrant work, not just in the planning of adaptation, but in the actual implementation of it, which is a crucial point I want to point to, that cities now have moved, in the best case, from planning for adaptation to putting in place regulations and built environment infrastructure um, and, you know, changes in how they handle their constituents that are in fact resilient. But, and we need more of those, obviously, but that would be number one. These networks are really huge. And, you know, we have 100 resilient cities, C40, CDP, the Carbon Disclosure Project now includes some um, resilience and adaptation measures. So cities that report into them are part of that uh, movement, essentially. Uh, uh, Urban Assembly Directors Network, I mentioned, but even smaller cities in the United States are benefiting from the National League of Cities, which has um, a focus on resilience as well. And many of the assets, even that 100 Resilient Cities creates for their 100 cities, are available to other cities um, around the world as well. It's not a black box. It's out there. You can go to Rockefeller and get their uh, city resilience framework and work from it and make it work for you. Because I think there's a, a lot of local visioning that needs to happen around this closing of the mitigation adaptation gap that I mentioned at the beginning of our chat today. So um, that would be one. I think the networks are really profound. Found. The second um, is I would say that some cities have become much clearer about the regulatory environment that includes more resilient action um, through, for instance, performance-based stormwater management or urban heat island mitigation built into the building code. Um, in fact, if you were to ask New York City, can you show us your resilience code, they would give you a library of over 20 ordinances that have resilience elements built into them. So that to me is a really fantastic way to ensure that cities, in that case, New York City, but you know, those codes are public. So if, you're, if you are in a city and you're uh, advancing a, um, you know, a new ordinance through city council, go and steal what New York has done and see how much it might relate to you, even if you're a very different size, because the language has been tested by a lot of smart folk and, um, and they've you know, had to deal with all their very proactive developers saying, no, no, no. Um, so I think you know, that's really worth figuring out. Is how can these regulations that some cities have begun to fit, fit into their regulatory uh, resilience profile be stolen and borrowed and, and managed um, with other cities? Um, and then I think the third thing, just in terms of how cities can really see, uh, you know, the magic of resilience is to work within their communities. Um, so one of the best parts about resilience and how it, I think, differs pro profoundly from mitigation is that when we mitigate greenhouse gas emissions, we have this metric done of carbon dioxide equivalent that it helps all of us in the long run, but it's out there in the atmosphere. It's, you know, our energy efficiency in the buildings in the city of Chicago may make those buildings slightly more comfortable and certainly does decrease the cost of um, their energy bill, but the greenhouse gas benefits are accrued globally. In adaptation, the benefit comes to you and me today. You know, when we plant a tree to um, mitigate the urban heat island, or when we increase the number of health clinics so that there's more available for um, the increase in air quality related health impacts for COPD or asthma as ground level ozone is exacerbated with extreme heat, those adaptations are giving benefits to constituents today. So I think that it's really important for cities to get on the bandwagon of both looking at their current portfolio and saying, wow, look at all the adaptation stuff we're doing already. We weren't even expecting this to be called adaptation, but I can pull together a whole portfolio of what's adaptation and then saying, you know what, given that one in 100 year stress test that I talked about earlier or what we're thinking about in terms of the scenarios of climate change impact, if we're allowed to take climate in our, in our context in our city, this is what we need to do now. Here's how we're going to turbocharge the existing portfolio of adaptation actions to make them resilient for you know, the next generation. That is brilliant. So in other words, you take the existing actions that a city is doing across its entire you know, portfolio of activities, you call them from health and, and infrastructure and, and communities and whatnot, and you identify what they're already doing that contributes to adaptation, and then it's a matter of just ramping it up and, and, and just making it conscious, making them aware. Uh, and having them, um, you know, do more as a result. Uh, yeah. That connects to budget also and budget priorities and budget management at a city. Uh, I'm in Puerto Rico. I'm, again, I've been here uh, 
you know, since 88. And, um, and uh, what, I've, what we've seen clearly since Maria, um, uh, a lot, we've seen a lot, but, you know, uh, on, across the board, but there are two things in particular I wanted to ask you about, uh, and one relates to that. Uh, um, let me just back to that, to that point that you just made. Uh, so we have these vulnerable communities here, low-income communities, uh, that, uh, that were exposed and, and were victimized, just like happened with uh, Katrina and Sandy, and, and in fact, just about every uh, natural disaster has its share of vulnerable communities that received the brunt of the impact, and it happened here. And, um, and so there's a lot of, you know, uh, conversation going on about, well, how do we deal with this next time? And, you know, what is it that we have to do with those communities? Um, and again, it, it touches health, it touches infrastructure, it touches you know, several issues, you know, power and communications and whatnot, that, that where they are more vulnerable than uh, other communities that are better able to, uh, to take the, uh, the punch. So uh, what do you see in terms of, of, of that segment when you work with cities? Uh, what are they doing? What can they do? Again, the whole idea of what can we trigger? What, can we, what button can we push and lever we can pull just to, to accelerate um, adaptation uh, in dealing with vulnerable communities in, uh, in that step. And then we'll come back to the budget issue uh, after that. Yeah, so um, equity. Equity is, um, to me, it is the same thing as resilience. So it's not that it's a separate you know, category. What we do needs to be done primarily for those who are less resourced, and when we do it for those that are less resourced, we create a more resilient place. And I think that even if I say that to my clients and we work together to make that happen, it's actually not very typical that they think in those terms. So there right now is, I think, a major transition happening amongst the adaptation professional, um, professionals in the United States anyway. To, and part of it actually really drives from looking at the tale of two storms between Hurricane Maria and Hurricane Harvey. Um, we clearly have failed in incorporating adaptation into resilience because the less resourced are so much less able to be resilient. Our systems are not set up properly. And part of the reason for that is that we have not transformed our system. So just a moment ago, we were talking about, oh, Joyce's idea, like let's go and collect all the cool things that are happening in a city that relate to adaptation and then pat people on the back and tell them to turbocharge and do more. Well, there's a failing in that, my, my system, because it doesn't actually address this seemingly insurmountable challenge of equity. It doesn't address these two insurmountable challenges together, equity and climate change. Because if we continue to mainstream what we've been doing all along, then we still are creating equity. Cities are filled with inequity. And so what I have come to appreciate much more in a way that I didn't know earlier in my career, and so this is one of those wonderful things of being able to reflect along the, you know, um, the timeline of one's um, impact, is that there's a transformation that's needed, a significant transformation. And that transformation relies upon understanding understanding that closing the resilience gap will only happen on a bedrock of equity. And the only way to make equity work is to work from within a community, not to go to a community and say, would you come to our community meeting and tell us what you think about our adaptation plan? No. What do communities need? What are their priorities? They're going to give you six priorities. None of them are going to have climate in them. It's going to be about, you know, access to jobs and access to health care and having a safer community and more beautiful place. And, um, and, you know, a lot of those key elements that are part of resilience and it's going to be up to us who deal in the scenario world of climate risk to think about how can I help this community to be a more resilient place knowing what their priorities are and I think it's um, really I, I, I give a lot of credit to groups like 100 Resilient Cities um, who have tried to figure out how to make economic and social and governance issues a part of the environmental and climate risk issues, but it's also groups that really are willing to work within the environmental justice movement and the climate justice movement. I mean, within the movements I'm talking about, the yeah. community-led, people of color-led, lower resource people-led initiatives, and follow, follow where they need, they think we need to go in order for their communities to thrive in this extraordinary changing time. Yeah, that is such a work in progress. I mean, it, it's, it's nascent. It's just getting started. Uh, just making people aware and conscious of the connection between, you know, poverty and, and, and hunger and, and just, you know, the, the kind of 
social pathologies that, uh, that these communities live all the time uh, mm -hmm. in housing and crime and whatnot and, and economic opportunities and connecting that with resilience, with adaptation and coming up with a set of to-dos and policies and actions that they can take and integrating everybody. Uh, that's just getting started. It's, it's, in fact, it's hardly even getting started. So, uh, so it's a, we have a ways to go. Uh, so, can I add something on that? I just want to be sure that um, I'm, I'm specific in responding to, like, how would you do that as a city? Because we're in the city section of your questions. Um, I think there is, you know, there are many tactics. And, of course, the one that's most important is to go into the community and listen, 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 and then become a part of what their leadership says you should do. I think, though, that there are also tools that city governments have. And one that I found very, quite profound when I was working for the state of Chicago is mapping. So the census map that describes poverty in your city should be on the wall of every commissioner, whether your health or office of emergency management or transportation or water management, because that map is going to surprise you. When you look at flooded basement complaints or when you look at urban heat island, that map is going to be like you're looking at the poverty map because this, the issues that affect the city typically affect the lower income portions of the city worse. And so that means that any city leader who wants to actually make a change in any of their benchmarks will do well to start with the most impoverished areas because you're going to see the biggest change there since they're already at the most risk. So I do think making sure that those census data that show where poverty are, or maybe you want to use um, people who access, uh, you know, no cost lunch for public schools. I mean, there are other, there are other equity variables that you could use. Um, maybe it's where new immigrants tend to reside or where non-native English speakers live. Those maps are incredibly important for decision makers to embrace and feel comfortable with um, so that they can make decisions that are related specifically to those lower resource, resource populations. That is one great point. Thank you for interrupting and, 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 and throwing that in there. It's, it's really fantastic. Um, all right, so anyway, so going back uh, to the budget issue. So, so uh, and again, you know, what we're seeing here in Puerto Rico after Maria, and it's been seen just about everywhere. Uh, but more so here, given the fiscal crisis that that the island uh, has been in, and even you know before Maria uh, um, uh, attacked us, right? So, uh, but there, there are a couple of things that are happening. One is, uh, you know, a, a jurisdiction, a city, a state, uh, mostly a city or a county that just does not have the extra funding uh, to respond, uh, prepare. Uh, and not just, you know, for the immediate shocks and, and, and disasters that hit a forest fire or a drought or a storm uh, of this, of this uh, category. Uh, but the longer term stresses or the longer term uh, slow burning uh, issues that you've, that you've mentioned. Uh, so one thing is just, just, you know, when they sit and, and, and do their budget and, you know, how do we make sure or what is it that they have to do when they itemize, when they seek uh, legislative approval, when they go through the budget process, the allocation process. Um, uh, and then, you know, secondly, you know, given the greater intensity and frequency of climate impacts uh, that are coming from now on, um, is there a strategy that you can point to that you recommend it to your city clients uh, for them to do longer term planning um, and to just make sure they have that money or that, that cash reserve? Um, and that, that applies especially and if we can throw in this dimension, uh, the places that do not have a FEMA, right? Because FEMA comes in here, you know, they're dumping billions of dollars uh, here in Harvey and, and in Florida, wherever, in, 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 the, in the forest fire uh, uh, states. Um, uh, and even in the states, FEMA's now stretched really thin, and they're, they're having uh, budget difficulties as well. Uh, but what do you see, and what is the conversation on budgeting in places outside of the U.S. that do not have a FEMA? And how do they go about it? Right. So the answer to your first question, I, we could talk about it for a long time. So I'm just going to be um, brief uh, around some very evident things around budgeting. Um, we know that Moody's and Standard & Poor's, the two biggest credit rating agencies in the, in the world, are now looking at both sovereign, state, and local government credit ratings from the perspective of climate risk. It turns out they don't actually know how to do that yet because, as you and I would agree, it's quite hard to do a comparable uh, look at the hazards or exposure between city X and city Y. But on the other hand, we do know that certain cities have already been put on credit watch due to a lack of resilience. Um, and we can understand why that would be, right? If a city is not resilient to the growing crisis of climate, 
climate change, then it's very likely they won't be able to pay back their debt when the stress or shock um, hits. And I think, you know, Puerto Rico is um, a, a tragic example of that. But in any case, the point is that budget folks live and die by their credit rating. And so going in to speak with them about what resilience would mean in terms of stabilizing their credit rating and ensuring that they never go on watch is, I think, a very you know, reasonable conversation to have. Moody's has a paper on it. It was just released you know, three months ago. Use that as your excuse to, to speak with your budget officer about it. And the second thing I would say vis-a-vis um, -vis current budgeting is that no geo bond, no general obligation bond should be funding stuff that's not resilient. I mean, cities do plan not on the quarter, but on the five year or mayoral cycle or on the decade or on the four decade if you're talking infrastructure. So use that to your advantage and ensure that there is every um, reason for anyone dealing with the general obligation monies, which is the major way where you know major city projects are funded, is asking for that one in one hundred year stress test. Because if you're not, you're throwing money away. So that's what I would say about current budgeting. In terms of this point that you're making, um, it's a multifaceted point about the future of budgeting and how to keep cities that don't have a FEMA or you know when FEMA falls apart, how to keep all of us um, thriving. Um, it's a, clearly, if, if there were easy answers, we wouldn't be in this extraordinary place. Um, but one thing I would say is that you know Puerto Rico, of course, is in more of a bind than most places because not only do you not have really the assets of continental United States, but you also don't have the assets of the development finance institutions. So you kept saying, you know, for those places outside of the United States that don't have FEMA. Well, in some ways, those places that don't have FEMA have a certain advantage. Two reasons why. One, the National Flood Insurance Program that FEMA promulgates really changes the marketplace here. It means that insurance is not actually priced according to risk because the U.S. government is the insurer of last resort. So there is no market incentive, therefore, to move away from the coasts yet. That might change if we can change the National Flood Insurance Program. So number one, it distorts the markets. But number two, in the United States, or outside of the United States, one thing you also have is you have to develop financial institutions who are willing to come in and give, for instance, the first lost tranche of money to blend capital from these major banks like the World Bank or the Inter-American Development Bank, um, and then therefore woo in private capital because you've taken off that top tier of risk for a project, or even allow for other government funding to be applied to a, a project that might otherwise be too risky for them to engage because of their creditors. Um, so I think that, you know, Puerto Rico is a very special case, um, and, you know, unfortunately, around these questions of finance, but it allows for us to think about the best possible possible way to woo in capital. And, you know, some of these um, ways that you do this are so obvious as to appear not to be worth airtime. But I, I see so many cities of every type, you know, whether they're cities that are graft filled or cities that are very sophisticated, that fail on several of these. So I would just give five points that I think are really important for wooing um, proper budgeting, you know, capital from outside, more debt capital and more equity capital into to cities. The first is that you have to have your priorities straight. You have to be very clear about what your strategic objectives are. You know, economic growth along with resilience to climate change, and this is what the scenarios of climate change say. Be clear and make it clear what your priorities are within that. You know, uh, more jobs, uh, um, you know, more growth in terms of um, people moving into our city, whatever those priorities are. And then um, be very clear on who your focal point is in the government for this proactive work around resilience so that an investor knows who to go to who, that can speak the language of what resilience is going to be. Because they're not investing in just an idea. They're investing in the physical thing that's going to change with their money. So having that focal point is, I, I think, um, something I notice is missing often. It's like, oh, we'll go talk to our budget office. Well, the budget office doesn't deal in resilience. You've got to have someone who knows how to talk both the budget and the, the, the resilience language. And then um, ensure that you have legislative, regulatory, and licensing regimes, essentially, that um, are 
allowing for money to flow in. And I would say that even when you don't, because I know, for instance, in San Juan, it's not a perfect regulatory environment. You know, there's, they're maturing. <laughs> and maybe Hurricane Maria is really forcing them to mature in some ways. But if you can point out where your bugaboos are, you know, it's not as easy to do business here as it is in other places. Here are the three things that make it a little harder. But we're going to help you through those things. And we're going to help you do it in a way that is um, legitimate, not graft-filled, you know. So being really open about what your legislative regime is and how you work regulatory is I think really crucial and then last I would just say is you need to have your data and this may be the hardest thing for very disorganized cities but be clear and open about your data be comparative um, bring data that show where your poor reside how people have thrived or not in the last decade how you compare to other cities of your type like do the homework so that investors know what they're dealing with some investors want to go to the place that's number 10 out of 10 in terms of not good on a certain thing and others investors want to flee and only go to those places that are you know the top number one so you know be very clear about where your data are and what your goals are going back to that strategy having a clear strategy um, for changing the the paradigm of you know, what those data say so i think those are some really key elements to creating a more robust environment for wooing and funding and finance to a budget constrained place well i think every city should just hire you i mean it's it's a fantastic <laughs> it's a fantastic i can talk platform. all about it but it's yeah, a great, I don't know. Do it, right? it's a great I don't do cities yeah. do it <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's a great platform. Um, uh, I think we can pretty much end it with that. Uh, we've ran over our time. Um, uh, awesome, Joyce. Thank you. Fantastic uh, information. Uh, I think we got some of these triggers, some of these buttons, some of these levers that, uh, uh, that every company, every city uh, uh, needs to accelerate uh, adaptation, to get with it, to become more, you know, go from awareness to action as soon as possible. So, uh, so thank you. Uh, Thank again, you, Alex. I'm so impressed that you are taking your own time to ask these profound questions um, and to then share some of the thoughts from others um, with a broader public. And I really am eager to hear what people think. Um, I think that the point of dialogue is super important in the changing, hopefully transforming field of adaptation towards you know, a more equitable uh, life and livelihood for all of us um, as climate disruption appears um, a, as a larger and larger problem. So here's to you for your important work and I look forward to staying in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Take care. Bye bye now.